a portrait of two messengers. During one of our Christian Questions podcasts titled, How Can I Doubt My Doubts? One of the discussion points was from Matthew 11:2. While John the Baptist was in prison, he expressed doubt and sent his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? When we took a snapshot of his life, I saw Charles Russell's life parallel with John's. Brother Russell expected the mediatorial phase of the kingdom to begin in 1914, but soon realized there were still things to be accomplished. He had doubt. So, as our title says, we will look at a portrait of two messengers, John the Baptist and Charles Taze Russell. And there are several questions we would like to ask. One, what were their missions as messengers? Two, what could be some parallels between the two? Three, what were their expectations and how did they affect their missions? Four, how can we learn from these messengers and be inspired by them to fulfill our mission? Think about their privilege of presenting Jesus, the Son of God, to the world in the first and second advents. They both were hand-selected and prepared through their experiences to fulfill these most critical roles. They were in the right place at the right time. Let's begin with an overview of John the Baptist. There were 400 years between the last words of the Old Testament in the book of Malachi and when the New Testament began. No prophets were sent to Israel during that time and Greek influence began to corrupt Judaism. John had a lot of work to do to get the people ready to receive the Messiah. But it must have been refreshing to realize that God finally sent a prophet to them. God had not forsaken them. What a relief. Let's read about John's miracle birth as the angel explains. Remember, his parents were beyond childbearing years. Luke 1, 13 through 17. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will give him the name John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he will drink no wine or liquor, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. It is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. The angel tells us that John would live a life as a Nazarite. Now, a Nazarite was an individual who consecrated their devotion to God with a vow. They could not consume grapes or alcohol, no razor could touch their heads, and they could have no contact with a corpse. Question book, seven, page 772 states, John's mission was to prepare the way for Messiah by performing a reformation work in preaching repentance and baptism for the remission of sins and declaring the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John was to turn Israel back to their fathers, referring to Abraham, Moses, and other patriarchs who were in harmony with God. Let's read parts of Mark 1, 4 through 8. John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea was going out to him and all the people of Jerusalem. And they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. And he was preaching and saying, after me is one coming who is mightier than I. And I am not fit to stoop down and untie his sandals. I baptize you with water, 
but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. John knew he was that voice, and he knew that voice was to proclaim Jesus as the Messiah. John had a clearly defined purpose, and he went after that purpose with everything he had. His miss mission was a monumental transitional period for the nation of Israel and the opening up of the gospel. Mark 3, 7 through 10. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say to you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. John had no fear of the powers that be. He exposed the hypocrisies of the religious leaders. They observed, questioned, and judged what this wild man John was doing because they sat in the seat of authority as the teachers of Israel. They had no desire to be baptized because in their minds, they were clean. They believed they were the ones who made the nation right with God, not him. Next, John explains his mission and love for the bridegroom's message. His joy was made complete. John 3, 27 through 30. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given him from heaven. You yourselves are my witnesses that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent ahead of him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. He, Jesus, must increase, but I must decrease. John clearly understood the transi transition taking place. Let's go to, now to the end of John's life. John was now all alone in prison. It was dark and dirty, and suddenly his life looked very different, and his work had stopped. Being in isolation, his mind began to entertain doubts that Jesus was the Messiah. John sent his disciples to ask Jesus some questions. Are you the one? Or do we look for another? In Matthew eleven nine, 9, Jesus turns to the crowd and says, But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and one who is more than a prophet. Let's pause here. Jesus said John was more than a prophet. He was a prophet who fulfilled prophecy during this critical transition period from the Jewish age into the gospel age, announcing the long-awaited Messiah. Continuing with verse 10, this is the one about whom it is written, behold, I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet, the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than I. John the Baptist did fulfill the work of Elijah. Jesus expressed to the crowd how crucial John was in fulfilling this all-important mission. Now, let's transition to our other messenger, Brother Charles Russell, and his journey finding present truth. The thoughts presented come from his words in reprint 3820. 
Many people questioned Brother Russell's ministry. They questioned his validity and his authority. Some of the questions asked of him were, quote, are the writers of your books and articles more than ordinary beings? Do they claim any supernatural wisdom or power? Or how comes this revelation of God's truth? End quote. By the way, this reminds me, these questions sound pretty familiar. Remember the questions asked of John? Are, are, who art thou? John confessed, I am not the Christ. Who then? Are you Elijah? Are you a prophet? Back to Brother Russell. Quote, no, dear friends, I claim nothing of superiority, nor supernatural power, dignity, or authority, nor do I aspire to exalt myself in the estimation of my brethren, of the household of faith. No, the truths I present as God's mouthpiece were not revealed in visions or dreams, nor by God's audible voice, nor all at once, but gradually, especially since 1870 and particularly since 1880. Neither is this clear unfolding of truth due to any human ingenuity or acuteness of perception, but to the simple fact that God's, to, God's due time has come. If I did not speak and no other agent could be found, the very stones would cry out, end quote. God indeed found the right person with such humility of heart. Let's continue with Brother Russell's story as told by him. Quote, Gradually, I was led to see that though each of the creeds contained some elements of truth, they were on the whole misleading and contradictory of God's word. Among other theories, I stumbled upon Adventism seemingly by accident. One evening, I dropped into a dusty, dingy hall where I had heard religious services were held to see if the handful who met there had anything more sensible to offer than the creeds of the great churches. There, for the first time, I heard something of the views of Second Adventists. I confess indebtedness to Adventists as well as to the other denominations. Though their scripture exposition was not entirely clear it was sufficient under God to reestablish my wavering faith in the divine inspiration of the Bible and to show that the records of the apostles and prophets are firmly linked. What I heard sent me to my Bible to study with more zeal and care than ever before, and I shall ever thank the Lord for that leading." End quote. God's overruling providence is evident, isn't it? In 1870, Brother Russell and a few other truth seekers formed a Bible study group in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. It was a time of constant grace, uh, growth in grace, knowledge, and love of God and his word. They came to understand that all mankind must be awakened from the tomb so that God's loving plan might be testified to them. They saw the restitution work foretold in Acts 3.21, but the two rewards were unclear. It was not until 1872 when Brother Russell gained a clear view of our Lord's work as a ransomed price. Remember, this is two years before our Lord's return. Understanding the importance of the ransom at that time gave him a better focus on how restitution works. It's important to remember that there, were, there would be no present truth unless Jesus had revealed it. And John the Baptist said that same, same thing in his witness. Let's read parts of Daniel 12, 1 through 4. Now at that time, Michael, or Jesus, will arise. Those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness. 
and will lead the many to righteousness. Daniel, conceal these words and seal up the book until the time of the end, the harvest period. Many will go back and forth and knowledge will increase. The natural eye can see that transition and amazing knowledge surrounding us. When we see these things, it means Jesus is already here. The spiritual and natural increase of knowledge was evident in the 1870s when knowledge spiked and hasn't slowed since. This marked the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. In 1876, the Bible group in Pittsburgh realized the return of Jesus would be an invisible return as a spirit being. Brother, Brother Russell wrote a pamphlet called The Object and Manner of the Lord's Return. About 50,000 copies were published. After his publication, he received an article called The Herald of the Morning, sent by its editor, Mr. Barber, who had read Brother Russell's pamphlet. As Brother Russell read The Herald, he saw that Barber's eyes were open to the subjects of the invisible manner of Jesus' return. The article said the return of Jesus wasn't to destroy the world, but to bless all the families of the earth through restitution. This was very encouraging to Brother Russell. Barber also stated that the Lord was already present in the world, unseen and invisible. The harvest work of gathering wheat had already begun. This was a new thought to Brother Russell. He requested Barber's presence and paid for his trip to Pennsylvania to meet with him to learn how he concluded that our Lord had returned. In so doing, Barber showed him the prophecies that our Lord returned in 1874. Brother Russell was confident after their discussion that Jesus had returned. He stated, I at once saw that special times in which we are living have an important bearing upon our duty and work as Christ's disciples, that being in the time of the harvest, the harvest work should be done, and that present truth was the sickle by which the Lord would have us do a gathering and reaping work wherever among his children. Because of this new enlightenment, Brother Russell curtailed his business cares and went full time into the great harvest work. His mission was clear. He co-wrote a book with Barber called The Three Worlds, which combined the idea of restitution with time prophecy, and they started a joint monthly journal. The next gem they learned was that in 1878, the sleeping saints were raised and that the faithfulness of those after that time would be raised in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, 1 Corinthians 15, 52. Soon after that discovery, there was a separation between Brother Russell and Barber because Barber professed he no longer believed in the ransom. To separate himself from Barber, Brother Russell started a new publication Zion's Watchtower and Herald of Christ's Presence. And in 1881, he wrote Tabernacle Shadows and Food for Thinking Christians. Later, over time, he created the six volumes of studies in the scriptures. After learning about the history of John the Baptist and Brother Russell, let's answer our second question. What could be some parallels between the two messengers? John was great in the sight of the Lord. Brother Russell was great in the sight of the Lord. John was filled with the Holy Spirit. Brother Russell was spirit begotten. John was a Nazarite. Brother Russell was a prohibitionist and lived a sanctified life. John did a reformation work, turning hearts to God. Brother Russell did a reformation work, turning hearts to God. John announced the bridegroom to the bride. Brother Russell taught the bride how to be cherished by the bridegroom. John taught a baptism of repentance. 
Brother Russell taught a baptism of sacrifice, exposing Christendom's error. John was present before John announced him. Brother Russell, at his second advent, was present before Jesus was announced. John announced the Lord's first presence. Brother Russell announced the Lord's second presence. John did a harvest gathering and a sifting work in Israel. Brother Russell did a harvest gathering and sifting work for spiritual Israel. John was bold, loud, and stood out. Brother Russell was bold and charismatic. John called out the religious leaders for their hypocrisy. Brother Russell called out the false doctrines of churchianity. The learned men or clergy of the day criticized and dismissed John. The learned men or clergy of the day criticized and dismissed Brother Russell. John spoke out against the illicit union of Herod and Herodias. Brother Russell spoke out against a church-state union. John said, all flesh shall see the salvation of the Lord. Brother Russell taught, salvation is for all, the ransom. John declared, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Brother Russell declared, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John expected Messiah would rescue the nation at that time. He had doubt. Brother Russell expected the mediatorial kingdom to begin in 1914. He had doubt. That's quite a few. <laughs> Before we move forward to our third question, let's consider a possible parallel about our Lord's first and second advents. The announcement of our Lord's birth by the angel to the shepherds, the good news of great joy to all people, was announced 30 years before Jesus' ministry began. It was a time for the Israelites to prepare themselves and to be in expectation of Messiah's future work as an adult. Remember, no prophet had been sent for 400 years. This announcement of his birth was huge. The possible, par possible parallel is there was an announcement in 1844, 30 years before the second advent of Jesus, which we know was 1874. Looking back in history, William Miller, an Adventist in the United States, and Mr. Wolf in Europe drew Christianity's attention to prophecy, predicting Jesus would return to take his followers to heaven in 1844. Then God would destroy the earth with all the sinners that were left. Well, this 30-year mistake from the actual return of Jesus positively impacted Christians to search the scriptures. So in both cases, there were history-changing events 30 years before both advents of Jesus. So what was God's expectation for someone to announce the proper return of Jesus' second advent? This is answered in our Lord's great prophecy found in Matthew 24, 42 through 47. Therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time the night the thief was coming, he, Satan, would have been on the alert and would not have been an, allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason, you also must be ready. For the Son of Man is coming in an hour when you do not think he will. Who then is the faithful and sensible slave whom his master puts in charge of his household to give them food at the proper time? Blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you that he will put him in charge of all his possessions. No one knew of the return of Jesus before it happened. Why? So Satan would not be alerted in advance. We know Jesus is pictured as the thief coming in the night in secret, who was the, fa who was the faithful and sensible slave. It's the one whom Jesus finds doing. 
the one who has worked so diligent to find truth, the one who has been given the clarity of the doctrine of the ransom and restitution in 1872, the one who could be trusted because of his humility. Over time, God revealed to Brother Russell all his foundational truths, the food at the proper time. Brethren, how blessed we are to know these precious truths. God has given us eyes to see and ears to hear. Ransom, restitution, the two salvations, Christ's presence, and that God is love, and so much more. We know that Brother Russell is described in Revelation 3.14 as the seventh angel or messenger. He was the only messenger that lived during Jesus' second presence, the last stage, the seventh stage of the church, which is called Laodicea, which means justice for the people. Think about it. The doctrine of the ransom is the only Christian doctrine that satisfies justice, which is the foundation of God's whole plan. In Revelation 10.7, the seventh angel or messenger's voice sounded, that the mystery of God is finished. The mystery is revealed through the little book, as mentioned in verses 9 and 10, which I believe are the tabernacle shadows and the six volumes combined. In eating the little book, it is as sweet as honey. What a, what a wonderful way to describe present truth. The plan of God truly is good news for all. Then, after internalizing present truth, it becomes bitter in the stomach, meaning we should expect bitter opposition, bitter persecution, and severe trials. There is a cost to representing Christ. It is worth it to be a light in a world of gross darkness. To have the privilege of representing Christ in the harvest work at the end of the age is beyond words. It is all by the grace of God. Now for our third question. What were John's and Brother Russell's expectations and how did they affect their missions? Well, John expected that Jesus would take the role of kingly power and free him from prison and together they would bring glory to God and Israel with a victory over Rome. Sadly, John did not understand that Jesus needed to come as a lamb to pay the ransom price at his first advent, and that his footstep followers were required to develop and grow in Christ to prove their faithfulness and loyalty over a long period to be a part of that spiritual seed that would help to bless all the families of the earth. How did his expectation affect his mission? Well, when the disciples of John brought back the answers to his questions from Jesus, Jesus answered, the blind see, the lame walk, leopards are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised. The poor have had the gospel preached to them, and blessed is he who keeps him from stumbling over me. As John's disciples began walking away how did Jesus describe John? He was more than a prophet. The prophecy he accomplished was the work of Elijah preparing the way of the Lord. I think this message got through to John about all Jesus said to him, even though his disciples were walking away at the time Jesus spoke these words. And he understood his mission was a success. I think he had peace and was dwelling on every word Jesus said. He didn't understand what the results of his part were, but the friend of the bridegroom rejoiced in Jesus. John's mission was not negatively affected by his doubt in prison. He did the work he was sent to do, mission completed. Now let's go to Brother Russell. What were his expectations and how was he affected? Well, near the end of his ministry, he also had some doubts. He believed the faithful bride of Christ would be off the scene in 1914, and it was getting closer to that date, and he was concerned that too many things in God's word must 
take place first? Well, let's look at the forward in volume four. And he wrote this in October of 1916, quote, the author acknowledges that in this book, he presented the thought that the Lord's saints might expect to be with him in glory at the ending of the Gentile times, 1914. This was a natural mistake to fall into, but the Lord overruled it for the blessing of his people. The thought that the church would be all gathered to glory before October 1914 certainly did have a very stimulating and sanctifying effect upon thousands, all of whom, accordingly, can praise the Lord even for the mistake. Our mistake was evidently not in respect to the ending of the times of the Gentiles. We drew a false conclusion, however, not authorized by the word of the Lord, end quote. In reprint 5950, Brother Russell said, the fact is that the harvest work is going grandly on. Well, what was the effect of his false conclusion? Well, many faith, many, uh, sorry, more faithfulness was shown by the body members who were striving to be faithful. You and I in this hall are very thankful we can still run for the prize of the high calling. Today, we have evidence of those recently answering the call to follow Jesus in a life of sacrifice. The door was not closed. Was Brother Russell discouraged? No, he continued the gospel work, but with the mistake he made, God used it as a great sifting work. Those who only believed in the man and not the message fell away. God used everything for good to find the faithful and loyal ones who would stay true to him and him alone. Brother Russell was privileged to announce the Lord's return. His mission went far beyond proclaiming Jesus' second presence. He realized that that present revealed truth by our Lord Jesus must guide his called out ones to understand God's plan and how they can be faithful to their calling. Brother Russell's ministry and understanding of the ransom from 1872 to his death in 1960, 16, was a 44-year ministry that blessed so many. Mission completed. They both lived a life of consistency and praise. They put Jesus front and center in all that they did, praising God for the privilege of service. As Brother Russell looked at John the Baptist's final experiences, he saw clearly that the final experiences of the feet members in the body of Christ would be glorified after persecution from the church-state union, which would cause our demise just as it did to John. When they realize the saints are gone, the great company that are left will be strengthened and a witness to the Lord's cause. They will also, through persecution, wash their robes in the blood of the Lamb and will all and will all have completed their sacrifice before the blessings can flow to mankind. The bride and the bridesmaids are made ready. But what about us now at the end of the age? What is our mission? It is 110 years after 1914 when Brother Russell expected the church to be in glory. He showed us that we're all part of the John class, the feet members of Christ at the end of the harvest. Brother Russell patched, passed the torch to us to continue the work of proclaiming Christ's return. We need to continue witnessing that the high calling is still available to those being called by God and to follow in Jesus' footsteps. Our message continues to be, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Our focus is to hold fast to present truth, which many have walked away from. Brethren, we need to stay true to the vision. Habakkuk 2, 2 and 3. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that we, we may run, that he may run that reads it. For the vision is yet for the appointed time, but at the end it will speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Volume 2, page 260. Quote, we should be so prepared, so armed, and so thoroughly furnished with the invincible truth 
that persecution would move us all only to greater zeal and not lead us through surprise or fear to lower our standard. We should not surrender when the kings of the earth stand up and when the religious leaders of the people are gathered against us and against the truths to which God has granted us the privilege of witnessing as his servants and ambassadors, end quote. 1 John 3, 1. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God, and such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know him. In conclusion, these two messengers, John the Baptist and Brother Charles Russell, were in the right place at the right time. As feet members of the John class, we too, brethren, are in the right place at the right time at the closing of the harvest. We have the privilege of being in the transition period of the gospel age into the mediatorial phase of the kingdom. Do we truly grasp the opportunity we've been given to represent Christ at this time? Our message is a vital, is as vital as it was for John and Brother Russell. So let's ask ourselves a mirror question. How will I proclaim God's truth? All to the glory of God. John 9, 4. Work while it is still called day, for the night cometh when no man can work. Lord bless your mission.